have Andrew Kircher, uh, assistant curator of the Dearborn Historical Museum, is going to be talking about Dearborn Township. So let's give an applause for Andrew. Well, thank you. How's everyone doing this evening? Good. Glad to hear that. I'm kind of excited. I have never been to this library. I will tell you right up front, I am a relatively uh, new person to the area. I started my job with the Dearborn Historical Museum uh, last September. So I'm coming up on like a one year anniversary here. And I will tell you, I moved down here. I worked for the state parks in Mackinac before this. So oh for the last like 10 years, I lived in a town with like 400 people. <laughs> and then I moved here. And it has been quite an experience. <laughs> you know, you could drive like an hour in any direction from Dearborn, and you're still just in a city, like the same one. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and people here are not weirded out by it. And it blows my mind. So uh, I really have kind of dived into the history of Dearborn. And it's been really fascinating fascinating for me. I will tell you, I am not like the be all end all authority on this thing. I always tell people, I don't know everything, but there's a good chance I can either look it up or find somebody who does know. Um, so this is something that I found pretty interesting. And I've done a, a lot of my presentation tonight is going to be on uh, the Detroit Arsenal. It's one of the most important things, I think, in kind of early part of Dearborn Township in that area. And you'll kind of see there's a little bit about Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Inkster, and some of the things that I think a lot of you will probably recognize uh, from around the area. So being new to the area, it was new information to me when I started putting this together a couple months ago. Um, and it's fascinating. I think I, I hope you'll find it uh, as interesting a, as I did when I was kind of researching this and putting it together. So one of the things I always like to do is start with a map, uh, kind of give everyone an idea of some of the area we're talking about. Now, Obviously, when you're giving a history, like we could go back to time immemorial. We could talk about the Anishinaabek, the native people who lived in Michigan uh, prior to European contact. Um, there were like Potawatomi, Odawa, Ojibwa, all of these native groups who were in the area passing through. They're fishing on the Rouge River, building camps. There are Springwell mounds. This goes back, like it's thousands of years. So, uh, you know, one of the early things that uh, really starts to change the landscape is the arrival of the French uh, in the 18th century. And the French are obviously up in Detroit, or Detroit, as you know, the French would have called it. Um, they're, they're all over the state. That's why we have places like Sault Ste. Marie, which like challenge someone who's not from Michigan to name that. And you'll get some pretty funny pronunciations. So the French are all over the place, and they, they have a, kind of an interesting system. I, I always just kind of like this map, because it's some of the very earliest claims in the area, in Wayne County, in the areas that would become Dearborn and you know Dearborn Heights. This has some of the modern things. You, know, you can see, like, there's Ford Road um, and the Rouge River. Um, has anyone here ever been to Louisiana? How about Quebec? Because those are the places where you're going to see this kind of land formation. When you talk about townships, one of the things that I kind of just debated on talking about, giving like a whole history of like townships and ranges and the Northwest Ordinance and how they divided up land. Um, it's interesting to a point. Um, it's basically why so much of the land is divided in big squares. You know, there's these huge square townships where people don't really live, and then cities with like jagged borders. Um, so most of, most of the area is divided like that all throughout the old Northwest. So places like Michigan, Wisconsin, and that's because when the United States acquired that land after the American Revolution, they had to measure it and divide it somehow, and squares are easy. The French, though, when they were getting here, they did something a lot more practical. You notice there are long strips of land, but they all are connected to the Rouge River. So that way, you know, you, you can farm back here, and you still can put it on a boat and take it out. Pretty easy and pretty unique. Something you see in, like I said, Michigan, Louisiana, and Quebec, in places where the French were. But these are some of the earliest claims uh, in this area. Now, uh, you, you might be wondering, you know, this is kind of a, a broader 
view of things. I think really the most important time for this area, and one of the biggest changing times for this area, is the War of 1812. You've got these French habitants, these French farmers who are living here. Things don't really change much for them as the area goes from you know, French hands into British hands at the Seven Years' War, and then into American hands, the signing of Jay's Treaty in 1795. For the average Joe on the ground, you might write your check for your taxes out to a different king or the president or whatever, and it's not going to change your day-to-day -day life much. This is where things really change, is the War of 1812. Now this could be and is deserving of its complete whole presentation, but for our purposes, suffice to say, the United States goes to war, they declare war on Great Britain, Canada here, and that war, um, well, it doesn't go so well. They're, they're fighting these guys, well-trained British soldiers. Almost immediately at the beginning of the war in 1812, there's a guy named William Hull who has a large force. He invades from Detroit into Canada. Um, he kind of loses a battle and gets terrified and comes back to Detroit and loses pretty badly. In fact, the entire war effort for the United States uh, doesn't go so well. Uh, they, they, they literally burn down the US Capitol. Uh, it's probably the worst we've ever done in a war. Um, war doesn't go well. At the end of the war, they kind of win the peace. Um, they go back to what's called status quo antebellum. It's a fancy Latin phrase for the way it was before the war. So all the borders are restored. And um, they're very concerned in thinking about this area, Detroit and its environs, because it was so easily captured by the British at the beginning of that war. They said, we don't want that to happen again. You know, if, if there's going to be another war, what can we do? So you may have probably heard of this um, Fort Shelby, Lerneau. Later on, it, it gets turned into Fort Wayne in a similar area and for a similar purpose. If you've been to Detroit, you know, like there's Fort Street and Lafayette. Um, it was right there by the water. Um, it had guns pointed at Canada. This was to prevent another invasion. Now, uh, again, how does this tie in? To Dearborn Township, well, this is really one of the first times they start thinking about this area because not only when Fort Detroit there was captured uh, by the British during the war, not only was it a, a blow because they lost territory, there were a lot of things in that fort. They lost a lot of gunpowder, they lost a lot of cannons, they lost a lot of guns and blankets, all the things you need for fighting a war. <coughs> Supply depots like this. The, Congress decided in the 1820s they really wanted to build some of these supply depots. And they're thinking about, well, if tensions come back with Canada and Great Britain, we need this in a more strategic location. We don't want it like 100 yards away from the border where it could very easily be captured again. What they wanted um, was an arsenal. And so they were thinking about areas they could build one that would be within a close distance of Detroit, the city was growing, there's a couple thousand people there at this point, but they wanted one that's not going to be in the middle of nowhere. And this is how they kind of wind up settling on Dearborn. If we go back to that very first map back here, you will see this huge chunk of land right here is a military reserve. And uh, I'll talk why they kind of pick this area in my next slide here. Now the area, this is a kind of cool drawing. Have any of you ever read The Bark Covered House? This might be familiar to those of us from the area. This is a book uh, by a guy named William Nowlin. And he writes it in 1876 for the 100th anniversary of the United States. Um, everyone was going history crazy. So he says, I'm going to write this book about when he was a kid in the 1830s and moved to, well, today it's, it's now Dearborn Heights. Uh, but he moved to the, uh, the Dearborn area. And this is what the area looked like. You know, they obviously build like a log cabin in 1837. It's what you do. But the area is pretty rugged. But it has some uh, important things coming up. There's more and more farmers moving to the area. But still, like, you're talking like in the dozens, less than 100. Um, you get things like this going in. You know, this is Buckland Bridge. This is another uh, Dearborn Heights location. Uh, Ann Arbor Trail. Uh, this is kind of where Outer Drive and Ann Arbor Trail is, uh, over that branch of the Rouge there. So there are people like moving to the area. This, this uh, is a much later, this is not built in the 1830s, this is like an 1860s home, but on the site. So there are farmers here, but not much else. But one of the important reasons they pick the area, one of the reasons it becomes so important, is this road. 
the old Chicago Road. Um, now this is sometimes called the Sauk Trail. It was a native trail before any Europeans got here. Uh, this is one of the first roads that's really funded um, at a national level. People realize that's going to be important for national defense. Like your army has to get around if nothing else. It's also nice if farmers can go places and people can move goods from town to town. That'll stimulate the economy. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, like US 12, Mich what's now Michigan Avenue, runs right through the heart of uh, Dearborn Township and right through Dearborn. Um, you know, this is what the road would have looked like at the time. It was just a board road. This was not like this. This is one step up above grass that you've trampled down. This is not like an expressway or anything like that. So that's one of the big advantages. The other advantage um, to this area. How many of you are gardeners? How many of you do any gardening? Plant flowers. So if you dig down like maybe a foot into the ground, what do you probably run into? Clay. A whole bunch of clay. There's clay all over this place, which most people complain about if you're gardening, but if you want to make bricks, this is the perfect location. You've got water, you've got clay, you've got the ingredients you need. There's pretty fertile ground here. You can grow things like straw very easily. So it's on an easy accessible route, something where you could easily reinforce Detroit or get those supplies where they need to go. And you've got the materials to build the buildings. That's why, again, it makes sense to build in what is now downtown Dearborn. And that kind of becomes the nucleus for all of the surrounding area. Uh, anybody who's anybody is going to wind up, that's, that's going to be the downtown and where things expand out from. Uh, what they wind up building is this complex. Now this is called the Detroit Arsenal, even though it is specifically not in Detroit, uh, but at Dearbornville, uh, which is what they're calling the area. Now Dearborn, uh, we'll see in a second where that name actually comes from. The complex itself, um, you've got these 12 buildings, 11 in a big square here. Of these 11, only four still exist today. Um, or of the 12, rather, only four exist today. In fact, half of them are the Dearborn Historical Museum. I suppose I should ask, this would be a good time, how many of you have been to the Dearborn Historical Museum? So many of you. If the museum got $1 for every person who was like, hey, I went there when I was a kid and have not been back, we would have no budgeting woes whatsoever. Uh, I encourage all of you to come visit. But you can see uh, we have the Commandant's Quarters and the McFadden Ross House. And we'll see more about it later. But it was all the buildings you needed for an arsenal. Now keep in mind, this wasn't a fort. They would not have defended this place. It wasn't like there were cannons sticking out or anything. This is a logistical depot. If you think about the arsenal today, it's up in Warren. It's like a kind of boring warehouse. It's, it's not a fancy fort or anything like that. They had buildings like the uh, armory here, so the armory in the arsenal, those words, a lot of people use them synonymously, but they, they, they mean different things. That's where they would have stored, you know, 50 or 60,000 muskets um, for the army and, and in times of emergency. There were things, there was a barracks back here, so soldiers could come stay here. If they were being issued guns, they might be staying at this location to train. Uh, and it could be soldiers from anywhere in kind of uh, the upper Midwest. So you could be from Wisconsin, and this is going to be the closest arsenal to you. So, you know, in a time of war, you sign up. They're going to ship you here. This is where you're going to, like, pick up your uniform and your gun, and you might get some training before they actually send you out to fight an enemy. There are other things like a gun carriage shed, because they also do artillery. They have to work on horses. You know, it's not a mechanized army or anything like that in the 19th century. And so this complex is built. And they start in 1833, they start in the Commandant's Quarters. And this guy's in charge, Colonel Joshua Howard. Uh, he kind of cites the place out. He had a really cool house uh, in Dearborn that they unfortunately tore down in the 1940s uh, that he builds at the same time as the Arsenal, as just like his private residence, since apparently this three-story building with porches that go all the way around it wasn't nice enough for him to live in. Uh, he gets his own place, too. So he comes here, and one of the things he suggests when he's like citing the area is like, who are we going to name this after? Well, that's pretty obvious, right? Henry Dearborn. Dearborn lends his name. Who is this man? Henry Dearborn was a general who fought in uh, a couple of wars. Uh, his service goes back to the American Revolution. He was at like the Battle of Bunker Hill. 
uh, so way back to the very beginning. He's the Secretary of War under Thomas Jefferson during the uh, unmitigated disaster that was the War of 1812. Remember, we saw the White House burn down. He was Secretary of War at the time. But a lot of people still liked him. Um, so they named the place after him. There's a couple other places named after him, but Dearborn, Michigan is far and away the most famous. I think there's a Dearborn, Illinois, and it's, <laughs> it is not much of anything. It never really amounted to more than a one stoplight town. So um, just a quick, I've got a couple of the pictures. I love looking at lots of pictures. I hope you do too. Um, these are some of the buildings. Like I said, that's the armory, uh, the arsenal gate. Uh, this is cool because we still have it. Uh, they moved it over. The Arsenal Gate, if you, that picture existed today, um, the road comes right through here. So they picked up the whole gate and they moved it eh, right there. Um, so they just kind of shortened the wall. But that, this is the original gate and the original um, doors there. If you come down Michigan, you'll see it right there. You know, this was a guardhouse. They stored cannons here. They did have about 12 soldiers who were stationed at the Arsenal as guards. Um, it'd be kind of boring. Um, they were there for uh, quite a long time, um, again from 33 until 1875. There were always at least about 12 soldiers stationed there. And in times of war, they bring in more guys. Uh, actually, two of the soldiers, thinking of Memorial Day recently, two of the soldiers did die um, during service at the arsenal. Uh, obviously not to combat or anything like that. One of the men uh, got kicked in the head by a horse when they were in the gun carriage shed. The other guy was a corporal by the name of Christopher Rocho. Um, they were blowing up tree stumps. Um, since they don't have a big tractor to pull them out, they would just like dig a little hole and put some dynamite under it. And uh, he was very badly injured when one went off prematurely, and he died the next day. Um, so those two guys actually died during their service uh, <coughs> at the arsenal. Uh, more pictures, you can see the parade ground here. They did store just like a ton of cannons. Those don't really have a good place to go, so they get stuck outside. Uh, other buildings you can see back here. There's a guard house, so it gives the guys a place to go back to when they're mounting a guard. This stuff was valuable. If not like worried about an enemy attack, if nothing else, uh, people would want to steal this stuff because it's worth money. Um, you, you would post a security guard there just like you know, Ford might post a security guard at a warehouse. Um, the Commandant's Quarters, there's another view you can see. There's that gate that, like I said, is now where this guardhouse is. And this building is, still stands. Another picture of the Commandant's Quarters. Um, a little bit later in life, when it's being used by uh, the village of Dearborn and later the city of Dearborn. And then it's eventually just given to the city of Dearborn in 1942 for something like $250. Quite cheap, the federal government transfers it to them. And it's used for a variety of purposes. Everything from a kindergarten, it's the fire station, it's the police station, it's the post office, it's the town headquarters. It's kind of an all-purpose building because uh, it's big. There's a lot you can do in there. There it is today. I kind of like that picture. Um, so you can see what it looks like if you haven't been downtown recently. One of the other things that comes out of destroying those buildings at the arsenal are things like the military inn. Uh, I take it, I saw how many of you were from Dearborn Heights, how many of you remember this building? Okay, so quite a few over here, it's spattering. Um, this was a really cool building. I will tell you, again, my background in museum work, my specialty is antique firearms. I was so jazzed up when I found out about this place because it purportedly had the world's largest gun collection. Uh, so a lot of these bricks came from the arsenal complex after they tore that down. So it's, it's going out into places like this. You know, this is Telegraph and Warren. This is in Dearborn Heights. Um, those bricks were sent there. That was not too far away or anything like that. I've got some actual photos of it. Um, the really cool thing about this place um, and I've got, I pulled these out of our collection. There's a guy, um, named, uh, Andy Palmer, uh, who is the one who, like, owns this military inn, and he's a huge gun collector. So not only does he run this as just, like, a cool local place, he's telling people to come there from all over. He's saying, you know, uh, once Greenfield Village is open, so there's people that are coming here internationally, Come up and have lunch at my military inn, and you can see the decoration of the place. This didn't scan well, so it didn't get into the presentation. 
This is what it looked like inside. It's it's like uh, you know in Applebee's where there's <laughs> stuff on all the walls. It's just, it's just guns everywhere. There's guns in the ceiling. Um, the other cool thing about this uh, this guy and the military unit, he publishes like a pretty well regarded newsletter. This was going out nationally. It's called Great Guns, um, and it's just it, it's like a gun collector's uh, magazine. You know, he talks about everything store guns or uh, gun deals, that kind of thing, uh, to some of the more famous guns um, that he had. You know, he supposedly had like some of Annie Oakley's guns, Wild Bill Hickok, all of these figures in the West, and especially in the 1950s when people really were into Westerns and these Western figures, they could come see like those guys' guns here. Unfortunately, um, after uh, Andy Palmer dies, uh, the military and like changes hands the family sells the gun collection it's not really interesting to go visit anymore and uh, it closes in the 60s so it's uh, not still around uh, but a cool connection again back to that arsenal uh, oh I did get one other picture you know there's Annie Palmer's famous military and famous guns I did find it interesting that they claim it's in Dearborn Michigan when it is Dearborn Heights today, but since it's 1956, Dearborn Heights doesn't really exist. At least not in a formal legal sense. So, one of the other buildings that you can still see at the Arsenal, and I, I include this one because it's still there. This is the gun carriage shed. This one still exists today. It's a cannoli bakery, and it's really good. So, um, when I'm at the uh, Commandant's quarters is directly across the street. It's like a siren call every time I work there. I wind up getting a couple cannolis. Um, picture of the saddler shop, um, the smith and the carpenter shop. The neat thing about the smith and the carpenter shop, one of the other industries that gets tied up in this area pretty early on in the 20th century, one that Detroit's known for. What is the industry Detroit is most known for? Motor, Motor City, right? So this is actually the home to a car company, the Detroit Dearborn Car Company, the Detroit Dearborn Automobile Company. It exists from about 1909 to 1911. It does not exist very long. They only make like 300 cars. Um, basically, Henry Ford finds out that there's a car company in his hometown trying to compete with them, and he buys the bank that has given that company a loan. He doesn't even buy, he just goes like two steps over their head and they very quickly stop manufacturing vehicles. But they're drawing people from all over the area. There's another view of the Smith and Carpenter shop um, where they were doing that work. In fact, some of the very early work they were doing was in this big tent outside. They weren't uh, particularly well equipped to run that. Um, they were doing uh, lumbering work as well. Um, Arna Mills was a large um, like carpet dealership and they dealt with a lot of fabrics. There was also a lumber yard that goes in in that area and some of those buildings like the arsenal burns down um, and the lumber yard gets taken up in some of that fire. Uh, so there's a lot of changes to the downtown there. Picture of the Sutler shop. Oh, I didn't include this. Um, this, is, that, this is Christopher Rasha. This is that guy who dies uh, in service um, when he's blowing up the stumps. Um, the Powder Magazine is another one of those important buildings. This one's set away from the rest because it held like 60,000 pounds of gunpowder. Uh, they didn't want that right uh, downtown in the middle of the rest of them. It's on that branch of the Rouge. Uh, this is, there's only two of them left in the country today. So they built a couple of these arsenals at the same time. This is obviously not the one in Dearborn because there aren't a lot of home trees around. Uh, but this one is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, and this is exactly what it looked like as built per the government specs. Um, that's you know translated to the real one. This becomes the McFadden Ross house. I think I have a picture of that in a little bit. So the arsenal uh, is again one of the biggest industries in the area all throughout the 19th century. There's some major wars that go on that bring a lot of people to uh, the Dearborn area, like the Mexican War, 1846. Again, pro in the 19th century, the United States Army is not like it is today. I think a lot of us have gotten used to how the Army has been since World War II, where we just have a big army, <coughs> we spend a ton of money on it, and they're ready to go at a moment's notice. 
That's not the case in the 19th century. Uh, in fact, in the 1880s, when the arsenal closes due to budget cuts, um, they have a, there's a 25,000 man army. So it's a smaller army than Belgium in, in, in the 1870s and 80s. So they call up all of these volunteers when there's a war. They said, we're gonna get your guns, get you trained, you're gonna go win the war, then you go home and go back to farming and you're, you're gonna be out of the army. And the army's gonna be tiny. So again, there's these waves of people. The biggest one is obviously in the United States Civil War. Um, this is huge, this is kind of the heyday of uh, the arsenal. Um, you got a lot of people coming here. Now this is that Ross house. Remember I showed you the powder magazine. Um, after the Civil War, they closed the arsenal, like I mentioned, and this one is one of the ones that is sold off to a family. They turn it into a farmhouse, like the ugliest house anywhere in the county, because it was a big rectangle with no windows. So they like carve windows into it and a door, and they actually make a bay window up here. Uh, but it is they do it all kind of pell mell. They do it little bit by little bit. It's not particularly well planned. Uh, but it serves their purposes. It's actually pretty uh, ingenious the way that they're able to use that very boring shape and turn it into a functional house. There's another picture of it. This is a picture that I really like. This is Brady Street right here. Oh my goodness. This would be standing at the corner of Michigan and Brady um, in 1910. It's like 100 years ago. <laughs> now, I know, like I said, I've been focusing a lot on the arsenal, but not a lot's going on in the 19th century in the area. This really gives you an idea. If this is downtown Dearborn and it looks like this, you can imagine the further you get out into the township um, in any direction, you know, you head all the way up up for Redford or out to Taylor, things like that. There's just nothing uh, because it's not a population center yet. Dearborn is less than a thousand people living in the area um, up until about 1916. Uh, and that's because there's a war effort going on. Uh, actually, if you come to the Dearborn Historical Museum right now, you'll see we have our exhibit up on World War I. And it's truly World War I and the factories, like the Rouge factory opens. <coughs> I mean, you, you can't talk about Dearborn without Henry Ford. Uh, it's through the factories that are opening through Ford. Uh, the Rouge factory that opens 100 years ago this year. Uh, at least the very early parts of it. That draw people by the tens of thousands to the area. It's an explosion. Prior to this, it's all farming, you know, it's it's just lots of little farmhouses a ways away. And now in Dearborn, you know, there's like a lawyer and there's a, like a blacksmith and uh, a few other things going on, some stores obviously, but by and large, not many people all farming until the 20th century. Um, this is the woman, Lizzie Ross. I always like to include her picture because I wouldn't have a job without her. Um, this is her when she's obviously quite a bit younger. Uh, this is her uh, very close to the end of her life in 1950 when she dies. She is the last person to live in that house. And she watched Dearborn go from that to basically what you see today. Um, she sees the town explode. She says, like, I don't want people to forget that Dearborn was a farming community. I want people to remember that. It's so easy to lose your history so fast when it changes that radically. And so she actually donates her house, all of her possessions, and all of her incredibly valuable farmland uh, to the city of Dearborn to be used as a museum. So uh, I definitely owe her a debt of gratitude because without her, there, there wouldn't be a Dearborn Historical Museum, at least not the same one that we have today. So that's what the McFadden Ross House looks like uh, today. Now, I also have um, a few maps uh, that I think are pretty interesting to look at. This is uh, circa 1860. So you can still see in 1860, there are large plots of land all throughout Dearborn Township here um, because it's being used by farmers uh, where you need lots of land. Um, you can see Dearbornville. Now it's Dearbornville uh, right up until like the 1880s, 1890s. I, I, if I looked it up, I could give you an exact date. Um, when the post office eventually starts calling it Dearborn and they stop calling it Dearbornville. Um, but you can see, like, that, that's, that's the downtown. There's, like, the arsenal and a couple of streets. It's not, you know, the rigid grid that you see everywhere today where there are lots of streets uh, going everywhere. Um, the river, you know, really dominates <coughs> the area. You know, you do have some of those important roads. You know, like Ann Arbor Trail 
that's coming up and going over there. That's one that gets going pretty early. Uh, Ann Arbor Trail, uh, obviously an important connection with Ann Arbor, another city that's that's already exists by like the 1830s. I mean, the University of Michigan relocates there in the late 1830s, and it becomes a pretty important regional hub. So having these routes between Detroit and places like Ann Arbor and then later Lansing um, are pretty important to the region. Um, we've got another one. Now 1915. Now you'll probably notice lots of small names, not much you recognize in the 1860s. 1950, what jumps out to everybody? Henry Ford. Right? So Henry Ford just owns like this huge swath of land. Um, and you can see how much has changed uh, in some ways and how much has not changed in others. A lot of these outlying areas are still very broken up into sizable chunks of land, not all owned by Henry Ford, uh, because they're farms. But you can see the downtown has actually grown quite a bit uh, by 1915 uh, as that hub expands, as more people are attracted uh, to the area. Now, 1925, uh, it's even bigger still. We've got things like a golf course. You know, Henry Ford is the richest person on the planet in the 1920s. It's pretty evident. There's an airport, um, basically where that test track is today, off of Oakwood, down here. Uh, it's pretty cool. Dearborn is the first city to have over 10,000 flights in a year leave from it uh, because of this expansion. Um, now, they really start to formally think about incorporating, they formally incorporate Dearborn in 1927 and uh, Fordson around the same time. But 1929, they're planning on consolidating all of them uh, into a big city. One of the recurring themes you'll see in Dearborn's history is it wants to keep consolidating, growing bigger and bigger. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But 1929, they come up with their uh, scheme to incorporate all of this, and it's pretty simple because they do wind up taking out this east part of Dearborn Township that's unincorporated land, uh, and cities, as we'll, you'll find out, and becomes pretty important in the story, a city is allowed to take land that is unincorporated and basically claim it when they want to incorporate. It's like, sorry, you don't have a claim on this. If you're not formally <coughs> incorporated as a city, that land's up for grabs. Uh, Wayne County has, um, you will see lots of incorporated land because it's so densely populated. There are lots of areas like, I came from the village of Mackinac City. There are lots of distinctions and it, it, it gets pretty pedantic between you know village and city and township and the rules at the state level of what all of those things actually mean. But for our purposes, uh, Fordson, which was made out of uh, actually Springwells Township, which was up here, uh, is the city of Fordson, which is named after Henry Ford. Uh, they incorporate in 1929, and you basically wind up with the modern borders of the city of Dearborn. Uh, that's why you have, you know, like Fordson High School. Uh, when that's built in 1926, it, it truly is the city of Fordson's high school. And Dearborn High School was Dearborn's high school. Obviously, they are all contained at the same time. And one of the one of the recurring themes you'll also see in Wade County is that these cities are looking to incorporate by the 1920s because of this bigger threat. You're always looking out for the next biggest guy who can take some of your land. And Detroit was the big guy. You know, Detroit was gobbling up all this land. If you've looked at the map of Wayne County, which I think I have here, you can see, you know, up here you've got Highland Park and Hamtramck. They are completely surrounded because Detroit, which starts out like this big, and then gets this big, and then gets this big, completely overwhelms them uh, very quickly as the city expands. Because you've got thousands, tens of thousands of people moving to the area in the teens and 20s. Once Henry Ford offers like a $5 work day, and he's got a factory, the Rouge plant, 100,000 people worked at that factory. It boggles the mind. Um, that this many people are, are moving in here and it goes so fast from a town of like a thousand people. So everyone's watching out for that next biggest fish. And again, that rule is important that once you're incorporated, they can't touch your borders anymore. Another place can't grab 
you know, some of your tax pro taxable property or your valuable land from you and put it into their tax base. So Detroit's the big player. Uh, you know, Dearborn is probably number two in Wayne County. Uh, but Fordson, this part, which was Spring Wells, and then it became Fordson, Dearborn, and this part, which was Dearborn Township, they all decide to incorporate basically to make sure that it doesn't just get surrounded by Detroit, like poor little Hamtram and Port Highland Park up here. They, they all saw the writing on the wall. Um, and this is what's going to happen uh, again. So once the, the city has its modern borders, um, the rest of Dearborn Township, it remains a township. You know, there's the village of Inkster. There's, again, Dearborn Township. There wasn't really an entity uh, called Dearborn Heights. In fact, for a little bit in the 1940s, the village of Inkster, they actually tried to rename themselves Dearborn Heights. Uh, it didn't fly. They didn't get it all the way through council but for a little while. They're calling themselves Dearborn Heights. Uh, now, one of the next big things that happens in the area is in the 1950s. So, um, this is Hubbard. Um, I take it most of us probably have heard of Orville Hubbard, <laughs> right? So, like I said, I moved here from Dearborn with 400 people. I had never heard Orville Hubbard, and oh my Maya learned a lot about him. Um, <laughs> that, that came as quite a surprise on the job. So, um, yeah, Hubbard proposes annexation. You know, he's running the town, he's being reelected with like 80, 90% of the vote sometimes. Um, he comes up with this idea in the 50s that he wants to have Dearborn this major player. He's concerned about, again, the influence Detroit has on Wayne County and the influence that Wayne County has over these areas. He figures if he's a bigger fish in that pond, he'll be able to have more influence over how rules go down. Now, one of the reasons that he has such a, a free hand to do a lot of this it's important to remember, um, if we again look back at you know, who owns all this, you know, this is Henry Ford, but Henry Ford dies in 1947. So who actually winds up owning all of this? It, does anybody know? It's, it's either Ford Land or Ford Motor Company, right? So they're the ones who physically have control. And when a company like Ford Motor <clears throat> one of the wealthiest in the country and the whole planet owns like a third of your town, you can't even count their property taxes fast enough. You know, you've got money just coming out of the ears from those guys. So that's one of the big reasons that Hubbard is able to offer so many just like unparalleled city services. Everyone will tell you, oh, you couldn't, you know, drop a piece of litter in town before somebody else had swept it up. And it's again, because you've got more money and you know what to do with because you've got all of this tax base. So this is what really gives him a huge incentive, and one of the things that's going to affect uh, some of these annexation schemes. Um, now, I know I don't like to read a whole lot, and you've noticed all the pictures, but I thought this was just interestingly enough, that the mayor just goes, he sent letters to Brownstown, Canton, Dearborn, Ecorse, Grosse Isle, Huron, Montanu, uh, Nankin, Northville, Plymouth, Redford, Romulus, Sumter, Taylor, and Van Buren, and he's like, hey, do all of you want to merge into a super city? Imagine that. You know, they, he's like Van Buren down here, these guys, Taylor, Brownstown. It would be way bigger than Detroit. It would be Detroit and like the rest of the county in this other super city that he would presumably still be getting like 90% of the vote and winning and be the hero of the day. And he'd be this mayor of this city that was now rivaling like LA in terms of land size and one of the biggest cities in the whole country. Um, obviously this doesn't happen, spoiler alert, there's not a mega city here. Uh, but yeah, this proposed uh, area is 375 square miles. Uh, and one of the reasons, again, he proposes this is it gives him that kind of flexibility uh, to be able to uh, work with the county. Now, um, they eventually, they don't go along with this. Some of, the, some of these don't want to be controlled by Dearborn. They want more kind of home rule, the ability to do this, especially if you're down in you know, Huron Township, you're thinking you know, Dearborn City Hall's a long way away, um, and that might not work out well for you. Some of these groups really did want in, uh, but the people of Dearborn ultimately said, eh, they've got a golden goose going. Because keep in mind, again, Dearborn has all that money from Ford Motor Company coming in. 
And if all of a sudden now you've got a mega city, you bring in, you know, triple the population, you've completely diluted it and you're not going to get it anymore. You know, one of the things they talk about is that Dearborn had something like $40,000 per pupil in the school district from property taxes. Um, so they've got this amazing money for schools. I mean, you've all seen Fordson, right? That, you know, looks like a college. I mean, that place is immaculate inside because they had a ton of money. Um, but they said some of these places they were looking at, like Brownstown, had like $4,000 per pupil. They didn't have the tax base, and so they were gonna dilute that, and there were arguments, I went through all these letters to the editor where people were saying, hey, I bought a house in Dearborn because it was more money up front, but I knew I was gonna get it back because I pay less taxes and we get such great services. And if all, you let everybody in, so when you bought a cheap house way out there is gonna wind up riding the train for free and get all these advantages and they didn't have to buy a more expensive house. And so it kind of became a case of like, well, I got mine, we don't want to let anybody else in on this gravy train because it is too good. So a combination of that and a combination of some of these places being a little reticent, saying like, man, that seems, that seems crazy, doesn't it? To like incorporate almost the entirety of Wayne County into another mega city. People, people in the 50s were just as incredulous about that idea as we would be today, thinking like, oh, that, there's going to be some issues there of all kinds. Um, you know, and kind of one of the last things I really wanted to talk about, uh, because I figured, you know, you guys are from Dearborn Heights. This is well within living memory, so many of you might remember this. Um, how many of you remember when Dearborn Heights incorporated? So, some of us. So, obviously, it's before my time and not from here. So, uh, but, you know, from reading about this, it's kind of an interesting story if you don't know how this happened. It kind of goes back to the same reason that Dearborn Incorporated. They were scared of the next big fish over. All of a sudden, these guys were a little scared of the next big fish over. Hubbard had a couple schemes where he wanted some of Dearborn Heights to add to Dearborn. Um, first, he asked for kind of the northern chunk. So we all know that Dearborn Heights looks like a big C, right? Yeah. He wanted like the northern chunk. And this went before voters, and they voted it down. This is like, no, for a lot of the same arguments about uh, tax dilution and things like that. And then he's like, well, how about just the southern chunk? Like, same thing, he said no. Um, he, a lot of people said if he would have put both chunks on at the same time, the voters would have been more likely to do that, but by breaking it up, he threw a little bit of a monkey wrench in the plan. There's all sorts of reasons, but those two schemes fail. They, they don't go through, they had these plans uh, to add them, it doesn't happen. But they are both concerned. They both realize, okay, um, we uh, we've got that on the horizon. But the real impetus that puts Dearborn Heights to incorporate is actually Inkster. So Inkster is down in the middle. Inkster has a really cool history. Inkster is obviously one of the suburbs that um, plays an interesting role. So it's outside of Dearborn, but it's still pretty close. I mentioned that $5 workday, like tens of thousands of people moving to Dearborn. Now it's pretty hard to talk about Mayor Hubbard and people moving to Dearborn without bringing it up, but you know, Mayor Hubbard was a pretty avowed segregationist. He was pretty open about that. Uh, he didn't like the idea of African Americans living in Dearborn. But Ford, when he was debuting that $5 workday, he did not care at all. He said he didn't care if you were black, didn't care if you were white. If you would work in his factory, follow his rules, you'd get that $5 work day. People came in by the tens of thousands, like we mentioned. So now you wind up with this awkward situation where there are like tens of thousands of African-American workers who want to work in Ford factories in Dearborn, but they're not really welcome to live in Dearborn. And so they go the other side. They, some of them go to Detroit, some of them go the other way. And so you wind up with this pocket of inkster, which is this huge bastion of African Americans living because they can't live in Dearborn but still work there. And so they've got this area that they're interested in incorporating. They said, we're going to incorporate our town because they have the same kind of fears that Dearborn might like bite off a chunk from them. Now they go to incorporate in 1961 and uh, they have to like define their city limits. 
One of those other important rules that would normally be super boring because it's buried in municipal code uh, and would put me right to sleep, but if you go to incorporate your town, it's important to know that all of your territory must be contiguous. It has to touch each other. You can't have islands of a city, right? So this is also weighing on their line. If Inkster incorporates down here and goes right up to the Dearborn city line, uh-oh, you've split the top part of Dearborn Township and the bottom part of Dearborn Township. And so once the people in the Dearborn Townships realize Inkster's planning on incorporating, and if they do that, that will preclude us from incorporating and really leave you between a rock and a hard place. Because then what, what are you left with? The town has like 80,000 people in it, and they said, like, we can hold, like, 95,000, it's, it's going to tap out there. They're at a level where it's appropriate uh, to have a regular municipal government and incorporate, but it's going to split it up. So three days before Inkster files their motion to incorporate, Dearborn Heights does. And what they're able to do, since Inkster is still a village, they include the strip right here. I'm sure you've all been on it, know this little area. It's this like super awkward looking strip that connects the north and the south part of Dearborn Heights. Now, um, this doesn't do any favors for Inkster at all. Uh, Inkster is rightfully a little upset about this. Um, it, it's a tough problem to solve because Inkster, this is something like 60% of their industry and like 15% of the city's tax base has just been claimed by another city. We're like, uh, what are we going to do? Um, it also so happens that, uh, at least according to a lot of the people from Inkster and looking at it you know, from a historical basis, that race plays a role in this because this strip happens to be the white part of Inkster. <laughs> so they wind up with a really convoluted situation where Inkster is trying to, the city of Inkster, or the village of Inkster, wants to become the city of Inkster, steps in to file a lawsuit to prevent North and South uh, Dearborn Heights from connecting there and incorporating, and they claim it's on the basis of a racial gerrymander. They said, you're just taking this white part of town, the Supreme Court ruled on some cases in the South, said you can't do that, and again, it's pretty bad for us because you took all that tax base. Long story short, after three years, the Supreme Court rules there's not a racial gerrymander, there's other extenuating circumstances, and that since Dearborn Heights got that paperwork in three days early, they get it, so they get the strip. Now, Dearborn Heights does wind up paying Inkster um, some money for the tax revenue that they lost out on by giving up that really nice strip where all of their industry was, and then Inkster obviously winds up incorporating very shortly after. And this is all just about 50 years ago, and that kind of gets us to the borders uh, that we have today. And I, I just thought that was just a fascinating story of, like, I never thought I'd be enthralled by municipal code and state guidelines for cities, but it's like, that's a pretty cool story, and it's really interesting to see how the social history of Wayne County and the nation as a whole, things like the Great Migration, are going to play into where you draw the lines on the map. Uh, so I know we've kind of touched on um, a large number of topics kind of all over the place, arsenal, the farming, and really picks up pace towards the end. Um, but that's kind of a, a, an overview, I, I like to think. Though now, we could talk about any one of those things for quite a bit longer, but I know we've got kind of a limited amount of time. So I figured this would be a good time if uh, we wanted to uh, open it up for any questions that anybody might have. Like I said, I will endeavor my best. I don't promise to be the be-all end all or anything like that, but I can certainly try. I'm curious, since you said to incorporate into the city, they had to be, what, what has, well, just skip what, what has protected Redford Township? Because they're a township, they're not, and they don't choose to be a city. That's a really good question, and I think that comes down to kind of local politics that no one really wants to grab them anymore. There are advantages to being a township if you don't have the population surplus, uh, because you can rely on, say, like Wayne County to do your roads, yeah. and you don't have the population. 
So the, you got to weigh the pros and cons. That's why so many of these places, they wait until they're like, okay, we've met this threshold. We've got like 80,000 people. We can tell. I, that's, that's something that is beyond me. If anyone here is a city planner, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. I don't know how they're able to say like, oh, our carrying capacity is 95,000 people. That's how many will live in this town within X number of years. I don't know how they figure that out, but they're, they're supposedly able to. And they can say, okay, this is the tipping point where it becomes more advantageous uh, to incorporate as to stay a township. Um, so, you know, Wayne County's at a point where they've kind of reached equilibrium. And you know, unless there's a major demographic shift and some people are moving around, uh, you know, usually taxes are lower in townships, but so are services. So it, it, it all depends. And I guess that, that's, a, that's a good question. But. Well, I remember, I'm 78 years old, so I can remember this period a little bit, that there was discussion that why do we want to be a city? It's going to cost us more taxes to be a city than to stay as a township. Okay, but this, I can see now what was the advantage, but... Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, uh, one of the things you may have seen, like, <coughs> come to your mail, is one of the other things I brought in from our collection. You might have read one of these. This was the City of Dearborn Heights, yes or no. Like, propaganda pamphlet that was handed out. It was like, here are the advantages to becoming a city. And, like, here's why it's worthwhile uh, to do this. And they said, like, you know, the... Uh, you get bonuses with school districts and the ability to control them. Um, it, it's and school districts for a long time didn't have to be consolidated until there were at least like 125,000 students. One of Hubbard's other suggestions was all of Wayne County have one school district. Um, I don't know how well that would have worked, but he, he suggested it. Um, so there were you know committees that made like official recommendations and things like that so i mean there were stuff on both sides but i, I just pulled this one out of our archive because i found it i thought it was kind of neat so if anybody wants to see any of this i'll have it up here afterwards but yeah there, there was heated debate because there are definite advantages and disadvantages to both other questions there was a city on the list that dearborn was trying to take i've never heard of it before and i didn't see it on the map um, yeah, I kind of looked into that, and I, I will be straight up honest with you, I don't know. Um, if anybody else knows, I know you are somewhat of a Dearborn Heights expert. I didn't see the city, and I didn't. Let's see, this is, yeah, Monogagon? No, I don't know, I have no idea. And I'm not from the area, so I thought maybe somebody else would know. Maybe a got up. So if that, that, there is a distinct argument for incorporating, because otherwise your township will wind up being a mystery to a room of 100 people. We're like, I never heard of that place. Well, I don't know. A good example of Dearborn Heights didn't incorporate what exists today is Brownstown Township. Brownstown Township never can become a city. Its, its borders are not connected in any way. There's gaps. So that's an example of what would have happened to us if we didn't take the strip. Yeah, because they wound up with like little... Because they're all over the place. Flips. So, you know, Brownstown can take a chunk, but like, uh, you guys can be on your own down there. Just a point. Uh, I grew up in Dearborn. I'm 84. I grew up in Dearborn. And I, what, uh, the schools were consolidated then. And I went to school in Dearborn Heights, or township then. So I lived through that, that school consolidation situation. But also, I didn't know much about it then, I was just a kid. But also Seven for the fact, ago. kids, because my dad, we from Dearborn Township originally, my dad lived in Dearborn Township and went to old Dearborn High School. So the kids in the township oh, well, were right the 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 real uh, high school. High school. Well, they went to Dearborn yeah. High. And exactly, Lori. I missed going to Lori by one year. But yeah, kids in the South End went to East Dearborn for high school. And some of those schools, one of the things I came across, there were kids who were going from like Dearbornville way out to like a one room schoolhouse in what is now Dearborn Heights uh, as far back as the 1850s. There, there were one room schoolhouses around that were dry kids. And in fact, with Lori, because uh, I graduated from Annapolis High School, and up until, I think I was in the third graduating class, up until, well, 1970, kids from the South End, Southeast part of Dearborn Heights, went to high school in Dearborn until yeah. the first classes yeah. graduated from Annapolis. 
and with a lot of places where you have smaller towns and cities. So like I live just over the line. I live in Melvindale. Um, and there's like, I was looking at school districts for whatever reason, and like Melvindale and Allen Park and part of Taylor have a school district that's all together. Um, I, when we have our school program, uh, every second grader in Dearborn comes to the museum. They go through a pioneer school program where they get to do things like make butter and learn about Dearborn's history and learn about what it would have been like to live here in the 1830s. We tried, um, oops, pretty desperately this year, um, which is like, we want more schools. Like, all of this stuff is not like that Dearborn specific that it wouldn't be applicable to somebody who's living in like Dearborn Heights or, you know, Detroit or somewhere around. Because again, the whole region when it's, and, and going back, you know, <coughs> when it's like Nankin and Pekin Township and before it breaks up uh, in the 1820s, all of this area has the same rough history of that time period that we're talking about. So we tried to contact like Dearborn Heights and we found out that there's like six different school districts for the elementary schools and it was super hard to plan anything with them because each school district had like different rules about field trips and who you could talk to and we're, we're, we pushed that one off to next year. We're gonna start early and see what we can figure out from that. Well, I know originally there was like six school districts within the township and like when we went to Lori, um, which was originally started out, they went to the ninth grade and then they transferred to Fort Sill. That was kind of a contract with the individual school district with the city of Dearborn that they would get the school aid, so to speak. Sure. Because there were kids in my class when we went, went for ninth grade and then they decided and applied to go to Cody High School in Detroit. So it was kind of an individual contract by the boards of education of all these different school districts. Yeah, I mean, similar things happen just with like Inkster. I mean, I was just reading today about how like Inkster High School closed in 2013. Like that's an ongoing thing of where, where kids are gonna get moved to. There've been a couple articles recently in the press and guide about uh, changing the districting rules for the Dearborn High Schools and like where kids are gonna go because the demographics are changing so much. Fortson is like the second biggest high school in the state of Michigan. They can't fit any more kids in there. They've got to move things around and balance things out a little bit. So, and and obviously that it's a closely um, related thing to like townships and school districts, but obviously they're not exactly the same because they they completely different rules, two different layers of schools and townships. And one thing interesting on the village of Inkster is that actually Inkster was in two different townships because east of Inkster Road they were in Dearborn Township. West of Inkster Road, they were in Nankin Township. So actually, Inkster was in two different townships. That's, I guess I, if, I, I guess I didn't really know how to work it in, but I will tell you my favorite thing uh, about the 1820s is that everybody was really excited about China um, and all things Chinese. It was very foreign and exotic, and so people were naming things kind of after China, and that's why there was like Peking and Nanking which were like the old, you know, Beijing used to be Peking because it was a different way to translate Chinese. So they figured if they gave it a cool exotic name, and like I can't think of any place that is less like exotic <laughs> China. Like, but you know, you know what the original name was, though, yeah? Well, there was... Uh, this was Buckland Township. Buckland, thank you, yeah, it's the name of the bridge, Buckland, uh, from the Buckland family. And actually, Buckland Township, when it was first formed, ran from eight mile to Van Bourne, Greenfield to Haggerty. Oh that was Buckland Township. Yeah, these, both the townships and like the county, at one point Wayne County was like two thirds of the state of Michigan. Um, the counties were enormous before they like whittled them down to more management. And actually what happened, and I wrote the book on Dearborn Heights for our 50th anniversary, that's why I'm, where's I know But actually after it became Buckland Township, we became Peking Township, Nankin Township, and then after that, Peking Township was subdivided into Redford Township, and actually we were a part of Redford Township for a little bit, but then they decided everything north of Joy Road would be Redford Township, and everything south would be Dearborn Township. Then. I am I'm deeply indebted to him. Uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand, and I have his book on my desk back at work. I was looking at it like right before I came here, so huge debt of gratitude. Yeah, so any other questions? Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, you mentioned about Orville uh, Hubbard being a segregationist. And uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy with this statue. But, uh, now they've got it uh, you know, in front of the uh, uh, McFadden Ross uh, home. Uh, 
But then uh, Henry Ford, he had quite a reputation as a uh, anti-Semite as well. Yeah. Yep. But nobody, nobody seems to bring that up. It's true. I mean, I think people do. Um, I think, and I could probably be just like treading on super thin ice here. Um, one of the things that I th think there's like a fundamental misunderstanding of like the Hubbard statue, if anyone's followed that. Um, I think there's been really like a false dichotomy presented that people either want like, he either has to stay here and the other side just wants to melt them down into little coins or something. I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think what a lot of people were upset about it was this place there without really any context. Like, we, we don't have a sign out there. We're waiting on the city government to kind of approve one. Uh, obviously, it's a very sensitive subject matter. Um, people said, like, hey, and you put them out front. And obviously, like, there's not a national debate. It's not like there's a clear cut answer. There's all sorts of problems. I'm sure people have solved things about, like, Confederate statues in Louisiana. Um, and again, so that same debate of, like, at what point is a statue celebratory versus at what point is it, you know, historical? It, statues almost definitionally are, are celebratory. You put it up because you admire a guy. That's why there's no statues like Attila the Hunt. You know, just nobody said like, "What a guy!" We're building a statue of him. They they kind of come with that connotation of there's someone who we agree with and we want to honor that person in some way. And some people feel obviously that that's that's a problem. There's ways to deal with history where you don't necessarily need to. You know, I can definitely see both sides. I'm obviously a lover of history. I work in a museum. I'd never want to hide history or anything like that. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge things like, hey, you know, Germany, for example, they certainly haven't forgotten about like the Third Reich and Nazi Germany, but they also didn't keep up like the swastikas on the buildings. They blew those up or took them off. But it's not something that's forgotten. Um, and I think that frequently gets tied together. That's an argument you see a lot of people saying, well, if you take that down, you're forgetting it, you're covering it up, and you, you won't be able to remember that harsh part of the past. But, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, long term, the goal is to actually move that statue inside the museum uh, as part of a renovated project. We want to have an exhibit that's going to be pretty cool on a history of Dearborn and the, the different people. Dearborn is obviously an amazing town and has some amazing diversities. There are people from all over the globe who live there. It's nationally known for that. And we want to talk about that history and have that statue kind of be a centerpiece for that discussion. You know, I will be the first to tell you um, that you know, Hubbard did amazing things for Dearborn. And it's unfortunate that that legacy sometimes tends to overshadow that. And that's what people draw from that. Um, Dearborn was not the only uh, you know, suburb that had these kind of segregationist policies. There were plenty of other ones. It's just that he was very vocal about it. Right? He, he was not ashamed to kind of admit those things. So it's it's. Difficult history is, is simply that. It's difficult. It's something that you need to tackle head on. So hopefully if I haven't offended everyone in the room or stepped on somebody's toes, let me know. I'll find a way to. Just a couple of interesting points if people want to check out area history. One, I don't know if Michael McCaffrey's in the room, but he's the library director here, and they're working on a project, but we have Nolan Cemetery in the south end of Dearborn Heights. It's at the corner of Van Bourne and Madison. And a lot of the early... Dearbornville and Dearborn Township pioneers are buried there. There's Nolans there, there are parties there. If anybody lives in the Southwest, and I used to live on Penny Street, uh, the Penny Farm is there. Up, and it was kind of interesting because in 2013 we celebrated our 50th anniversary as a city, and at that point in time the two oldest homes in the city were still standing. The one was on Warren, where they just took, they took it was a Chamber of Chamber Commerce, Commerce, and it was a lawyer's <laughs> office and they tore it down yeah. and they built a strip mall there. Yeah. Yeah. That was the oldest house standing oh, at the wow. time. Oh. Yeah, the other one was in the South End on Penny, uh, east of Gully. And we celebrated our 50th anniversary in April of 2013. And in the, the summer of the fall, kids got in there and they burnt the house down. Oh. It's right by foreign school in that area there. Oh. But you can go by the cemetery today. Yes, yeah, to not end on like uh, a downer like that, the cemetery, I know there are a number of volunteers that I see on a regular basis at the museum who have been doing their best to keep up the cemetery, and repair headstones, and reinstall ones that are there. There are a couple Civil War veterans who are, who are buried there. And actually, these guys right here, 
they are buried in that cemetery, the Dowland Cemetery. Because this is the Nowlands. Well, there's William and there's Dad John. So John was born in like 1853 or 1753. Uh, and he is buried uh, in the Nowland Cemetery. It's a cool place. Unfortunately, I think there was a truck that yeah. like tipped over and destroyed like a corner of the fence. Right. And like from my understanding, the city got insurance money from it, but they have not. It's in the process. It, they're anyway. like working on fixing yeah. the fence. Yep. So there's like orange, like that snow type fence. It's also looking to try to get a state historical designation for the cemetery as well. It's pretty cool. I've been there and I have it right now. All right, well, I don't want to take up uh, too much of your time. Maybe one more question. What are the museum hours? That is an excellent question. Um, I'm might not have enough, but I have some more in my car if anyone would really like one. I have some uh, brochures. So our hours, we are open Monday through Friday from 8 to 5, and that's at the McFadden Ross House, and that's where the museum office Brady. is, all right there on Brady. It's where we have the Gardner House. Richard Gardner was another one of these early families. You can see what a house looked like in the 1830s. The Commandant's Quarters uh, is open Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 3, or by appointment. We can open any of the buildings like at any time. We just need to know. Uh, you are looking at the only full-time employee of the museum. We do not have a large staff. We have a couple part-time workers, myself, and volunteers. So we are always looking for volunteers. If anybody likes history or you know you want to give back to your community and deal with cool stuff, please come in. We would love to have you. Even if you can give us like four hours or something like that. Um, Come on in. We, we would love to have help. We really, I, I can't do it by myself. I will be the first to tell you. I just simply can't. Uh, I, there's not enough time uh, for all the things that go on. And I think we do cool activities and cool events. I would encourage you to visit. If nothing else, check out our website. It's uh, www.thedhm.com. So um, yeah, I've got you know information. Here, uh, so if anybody has like any questions, or anything you want to talk to me about, I'll be up here. But otherwise, uh, thank you so much. You guys have thank been. You. Very <laughs>